Um, first of all, I'd just like to say a big thank you to Lily for inviting me back um, to, to talk on this occasion about practical advice. Uh, it's nice to see so many familiar faces here and a few new ones. Uh, that means that my colleagues in other uh, centres are, are, are doing their job and making diagnoses, uh, and that's great. Um, so, how's the crash course in, in A-level mitochondrial disease going? Um, you'll stay on board. This session is going to be a little bit lighter. I'm very happy to be interrupted about anything that I say. If you think I'm talking rubbish, pick your hand up and shout out and say, say so. Okay. Um, what we're going to try and do uh, on my back of an envelope plan is to get through some common symptoms and the management, nutrition and feeding, uh, emergency admissions, education, acute illness, immunizations, operations. You get the idea. There's quite a lot to cover. Thankfully, Alison sent me a list of questions that she had canvassed, and I'm going to try and stick to a lot of those. So I'm going to start with common symptoms. Um, and these are symptoms that affect largely children, but also adults with, with mitochondrial disease. And the first of those is gastroesophageal reflux. Uh, it's G-O-R-D, or if you're American, G-E-R-D. Uh, and it's, everybody knows it as reflux. So why does reflux occur and what, what is it? Well, um, if you look at this diagram, and I didn't realize there were going to be two screens, but if you look at this diagram, this is the stomach, and it's got a liquid in it. And there's a sphincter just here, so the esophagus is the, the pipe that connects the mouth to the stomach is the esophagus. And it comes down and there's a, what's called a sphincter here, or a muscle. And under normal circumstances, that muscle is closed. Um, and that keeps the contents of the stomach in the stomach. If the contents of the stomach are fizzy pop or lager, then there's quite a bit of gas generated, and that gas is generated here, and that sphincter will open and you'll get a burp. Okay, but in young children, and babies in particular, that muscle's very lax. And this situation can occur where the sphincter isn't completely closed, there's liquid or food in the stomach, and depending on position of the baby or the young child or the adult, that food or liquid can go back up the esophagus somewhat. In itself, that may not be a problem, but if the contents of that stomach are actually acidic, then that starts to cause problems at the base of the esophagus, because the stomach is very well protected against acid, but the esophagus isn't. And so if those acid contents of the stomach go back up into the esophagus, they can cause erosions at the base of the esophagus and pain. The other thing that can happen, and why I've, I've got this diagram on here, is that this is the esophagus, this is the airway. So this big thing here is the tongue, comes down, and normally the blue arrow is air going down, going down into the lungs. And this bit here, this little lever here, normally closes over and protects the airway when we swallow, so that things don't go down the wrong tube. Now, occasionally they, they do for everyone, but normally that closes over. If you've got reflux, there is a potential for the fluid or feed that's in the stomach to come back up the esophagus and go down into the airway because a swallowing mechanism hasn't been initiated and that little lever hasn't closed off. So the airway's not protected. And that, sorry, and that can lead to problems with, in, certainly in young children, pauses in their breathing, recurrent aspiration pneumonia, and difficulties with, with, with their lungs, essentially. The good news is there's treatment for gastroesophageal reflux. Um, very simple measures, adding some gaviscon. Gaviscon acts as a raft that sits on top of this fluid in the stomach um, and helps prevent the erosions that can occur in the esophagus. Um, small and more frequent feeds, so practical advice in terms of not giving a huge feed, not drinking lager in such, such large quantities. Or adding a meprazole. A meprazole is a drug that reduces the acid production in the stomach. So that even if the contents of the stomach do go the wrong way, they're not particularly acidic and they're not going to cause problems with inflammation in the, uh, either the airway or the esophagus. And there are guidelines that are available 
online to your GP, to your paediatrician, about what to do with gastroesophageal reflux disease. This is a common disease. It's not restricted to mitochondrial disorders. It's a very widespread, very common disorder. About 40% of young infants have some degree of gastroesophageal reflux. And those guidelines are produced by the National Institute for Clinical for Healthcare and Care Excellence, NICE. Um, so they're easily accessible online. Information about when to refer to a pediatric gastroenterologist and the steps to take in terms of management of that disease. Okay, sticking with the bowel, this time at the other end, constipation and gut motility problems are a real problem for patients with mitochondrial disease. Why is that? Well, this is the bowel here. If you were to disembowel someone, I'm not that I'm suggesting you should, but if you were to disembowel someone and put the gut out over the uh, floor, it could stretch out to the size of a tennis court. You stretched it. So it's a massive organ, massive organ. And it's essentially a tube from one end to the other with very specialized functions at various bits. But it's also a muscle. In fact, there's several layers of muscle, and this is just a sort of breakdown of that muscle. But the red stuff here is muscle, and that's orientated in different ways around the gut. And that muscle helps propel food uh, and waste products through the gut. And muscle, as we know, is packed full of mitochondria. When the mitochondria aren't working, that muscle isn't getting its energy supply to do the job that it needs to do. So the gut becomes this motor. Okay? It doesn't move in the way that it should. And if it's not moving in the way that it should, then we get this situation occurring. These yellow dots are showing stool, feces in the large uh, intestine, all the way down here. And that is essentially a situation called uh, impaction. And, and is one step away from a pseudo-obstruction, an emergency situation. <coughs> are there ways to manage this? Well, there are. Uh, one of the speakers earlier alluded to some research that's going on in Newcastle in terms of a low-residue diet, which may be helpful. That seems counterintuitive to most of the advice we get about managing bowels, which is take lots of fiber. But in fact, uh, in patients with mitochondrial disease, where there's a problem with motility, actually a low-residue, low-volume, feed may be uh, better. Um, drinking lots of fluids, uh, so lots of water to maintain hydration, giving plenty of fluid for the gut uh, to, to deal with uh, the, the food that it has. And of course then laxatives. Um, Novicol chocolate, this is called. <laughs> I'm not sure whether that was clever marketing. <laughs> I certainly don't need to tell anyone in this room about mother called chocolate. No. But it is an osmotic laxative. Uh, and by that I mean a laxative that draws water into the bowel. Uh, and so softening the stool and allowing that to be passed. There are various other forms of laxative that are, that are available. Pain. So Alison sent me a question saying, do, do children with, with mitochondrial disease feel pain? And of course they feel pain, and they feel pain just like anyone else. Sometimes the difficulty in a child who's not communicating very well is telling someone that they have pain. And that can be a real problem. How can we recognize that? Well, it may be simply that this is a change in the child's mood, a change in their sleep pattern, their appetite, their posture, Sometimes it's going through a list of things that you think, is this pain, is this, is this indicating to me that my child's suffering from pain? And it might be associated with specific symptoms, <coughs> so it's important to recognize that pain. So you've got a child who has problems with tone, particularly in their legs, that may lead to displacement of their hips, and if that happens suddenly, that can be a very painful pro um, thing to happen. Um, it can be as a result of reflux disease. So if, it, if the child seems to be distressed and is vomiting, it may be that reflux is responsible. And indeed, the mitochondrial disease itself might be causing neuropathic pain. Hey, sorry. Again, very good question. So um, Faye's just asking me what would help a specific form of pain, uh, and that's pain that's related to dystonia. Now dystonia is an increase in tone that causes contraction of the muscles. And it's a very severe contraction of the muscles and it's sustained and it's often twisting. 
and that kind of muscle pain can be difficult to manage, the first thing that we try to do in that situation is relieve the muscle tension, and that's through use of drugs like uh, diazepam. So um, diazepam, gabapentin, and pregabalin are other centrally acting analgesics that can be helpful. Um, there are, of course, other stronger analgesics in terms of oromorph or fentanyl patches. But what we try to think about management of analgesic is as a sort of ladder. And you start with very simple analgesia at the bottom and work up. Now, there have been some concerns <coughs> expressed about use of paracetamol and, and ibuprofen in, in patients with mitochondrial disease. And, and really, that's not about the mitochondrial disease, but about the specific symptoms that those patients <coughs> suffer from. So involvement of the liver might suggest that you don't use paracetamol. Involvement of the kidneys would suggest that you don't use ibuprofen. Okay. <coughs> Nutrition and feeding. Um, I've mentioned low residue diet. As far as possible, the diet needs to be balanced. And it needs to be balanced in terms of the carbohydrates, the fats, uh, and the proteins that are given. Some people are on very specialized diets, like the ketogenic diet, which is a, a high proportion of fat to carbohydrate, uh, and that's often in patients who have uh, epilepsy as part of their clinical problem. Um, but as far as uh, for everyone else, it really should be a, a balanced diet. Sometimes it is helpful to have starchier products in terms of the carbohydrates. Uh, if you're having particularly as an evening meal, that will release the sugar slowly over the course of the evening and night, so or an overnight uh, release of, of carbohydrate. And patients with mitochondrial disease should, as far as possible, avoid periods of fasting. So we all naturally fast overnight from our, our last meal in the evening to breakfast the following morning. Breakfast comes from breaking that fast. Um, and, and so that is a natural time um, where, where we're fasting. But other times where we might be fasting for somewhat longer is, for instance, in relation to operations. Um, and that needs to be borne in mind, and I'll touch on that again uh, in, a, in a couple of slides' time. But in terms of preparing for an operation, there's often a period of fasting. That can often be six to eight hours. Um, and that's not a great idea for our patients with mitochondrial disease. Very quick question when you're talking about cuts. And um, we were saying that sometimes has nausea that's connected to, to um, of gastro issues. Um, she also suffers persistently with incontinence. Is that connected? With incontinence? Yes. It, it, it probably is likely to be, uh, and we might be able to come back to that in, the, in one of the breakout groups this afternoon. Yeah. But gut motility problems um, go from the top end right through to the bottom. And, and sometimes people who have problems opening their bowels actually have what's called overflow incontinence. So the impaction can be there, and actually they pass a liquid stool because the um, stool is bypassed by the liquid stool. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I think those patients should avoid fasting and dehydration. Uh, I'll, I'll come, in the interest of time, I'll not spend any time now on vitamins, but I'll come back to that in a moment. What I do want to, to mention briefly um, are feeding tubes. So there's several different forms of feeding tubes, um, and I'm sure many of you will be very familiar with them. Um, <laughs> yeah? Those. Sugar, sugar is very important in terms of energy. So sugar is the, is the principal carbohydrate that we use. Uh, and it is vitally important in terms of providing energy. Sugar and fat are the two principles that, that, that we use. Um, so feeding tubes are a way of getting sugars and fat in, uh, and protein as well. Um, a nasogastric tube is the most simplest form to use. Um, but any of you who have had young babies with NG tubes in will know often the tube doesn't stay in for very long. <laughs> so if it's going to be a permanent situation and you need to put in either a peg or a pedge, um, and the difference between those is that a peg is going into the stomach, whereas a pedge is going into the jejunum. And there are tubes now that can be passed from the stomach right through into the jejunum, and they have a, a, a little vent uh, for um, 
for the, that sits in it's a, it's basically a, a hole in that tube that sits in the, uh, the stomach and allows the stomach to be vented. And that's just a sort of button peg uh, example in, a, in an older individual there. So those are, are different ways of, of feeding people. Um, PEG is often uh, the, the feeding tube of choice now, particularly in children who have reflux disease, because this is basically bypassing any food going into the stomach. Okay, another scenario is that of emergency admissions. Two minutes left, right? Do you want to stay a little bit until your lunch time? Because I'm not going to do this in two minutes. <laughs> Wouldn't do it justice. Um, emergency care plans, what do I need to bring to A&E? Okay, so Joe mentioned this morning about emergency care plans. I think most of the major centres now do issue with emergency care plans. If you haven't got one, what's really helpful is your last clinic letter. Um, and most clinicians now are detailing problems and drug lists on their, uh, their letters. And that's very helpful for the poor SHO in A&E who's faced with an expert parent who knows more about mitochondrial disease than they're ever going to know. And they've got to stand there in front of you and say, yes, I know what I'm doing. I really know what I'm doing. And they don't. Um, moreover, if that's your second attendance in a week, and you haven't got the same junior doctor, and steam's coming out of your ears because you're going through the same thing again as you did the week before. So actually having something written down, either from your center, um, or even if you want to write something down yourself, or as has been suggested, keeping a file um, with all of the results and things, and it is immensely helpful. To be fair to those SHOs in A and E, their first job is to ensure that ABC, airway, breathing, and circulation are absolutely fine. It's an emergency situation for them. That's what they've got to do. The fine detail you can fill in later. What's also helpful is to try and preempt those emergencies. Contact people during working hours. Okay, there should be a contact for the mitochondrial center that you attend. You should also try and establish point of contact either with a metabolic nurse or a pediatric neurology nurse at your local centre. Okay? And try and anticipate those problems. If they are contacted, they know there's an issue, they'll be able to put you in, in touch or alert one of the clinicians who's around at that time on call. They can speak with your particular concern. That's how things work. When you end up in A&E out of hours, and sometimes that is unavoidable, then that's a much more difficult process to enact until the following day. Okay, does there, I mean there are a few questions up there. Uh, is it necessary to have advanced planning of scenarios? There's, I mean mitochondrial disease is so diverse. It's so difficult to plan for every possibility. But there are some common ones. Uh, things like pneumonias, uh, things like seizures, dystonic crises. There are, there are various different scenarios that you could potentially plan for, but they'll be relevant to the, the disease as it's presenting in your child. Okay. And those are the sorts of things that your clinician should be talking you through um, when, when they see you in, in a clinic. We don't need no education, we don't need no thought control. Pink Floyd got it right, but not for mitochondrial disease patients. Your kids do need education, and they need education for various reasons, not least socially. It's important for children to integrate into society. Okay? It's important for them to make those contacts. It's important to get enjoyment out of going to school. We all like to think we didn't like school. Actually, we probably did like school, most of us. When they go to school, they they do need some um, input in terms of their teachers and their head teachers knowing that they've got mitochondrial disease. They know that they, these teachers need to know that the kids might need a little snack, they might become fatigued, they need to be well hydrated. Okay, so all of those things need to be in place. So having a discussion with the teacher uh, or the head teacher is really helpful in that respect. Um, 
almost all children with, with mitochondrial disease should be on an educational health care plan. Uh, and that's a commitment to meet the needs of your child in that uh, education environment. And that's a statutory requirement that they will, those needs will be met. It's a very useful tool to have that EHCP. And children uh, with mitochondrial disease often have physiotherapy, occupational therapy, or speech and language therapy needs, and those can be delivered in a school environment. So forget what Pink Floyd said, we do need education. Acute illness, I touched on this a little bit in terms of emergency admissions. Um, again, first thing, not to panic. Um, ensure hy good hydration. If child's still eating, then a little uh, and often. If it's peg feet, same thing, a little and often, not overloading them. Um, if the child has diabetes, then it, it is advisable to seek um, uh, advice from the diabetes team at your local hospital. Um, uh, Alison had a few questions in terms of uh, should we have antibiotics on standby? Again, prophylactic antibiotics can be really helpful over the winter months for children who have had evidence of recurrent pneumonias. So giving uh, uh, antibiotics like azithromycin or septrin through the winter months can be uh, uh, remarkably helpful, uh, but not to have at home in a cupboard to take out when you think the child has um, uh, a fever. Uh, it is really important in that situation that actually they are assessed properly. Okay? Um, because a partially treated meningitis is not something that anyone wants to see a week down the line in a um, uh, Well, for those of you who like three-letter abbreviations, this is TYG, trust your gut. Okay, you just got to, you know your child, you know when things aren't right, and, and you've got to take that responsibility on board and say, right, okay, I've had enough, I've reached the threshold that I'm comfortable with, I need to seek some professional support here. Okay, immunizations and vaccinations. I'm flying through these now to keep the time because I can see you're all getting very hungry. Um, immunizations are important. The immunization schedule in the UK is not particularly onerous compared to some other um, uh, countries worldwide. The diseases that we vaccinate for are all important. We tend to think of things like measles and mumps as fairly mild diseases. They are not. They are not in some circumstances. And the children who get those worst are children who are debilitated in other ways. So measles can be a really nasty disease. Um, mumps can be a very nasty disease, as can rubella. Okay. Um, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis um, are often given very early, uh, two, three, and four months. Um, and, and sometimes that's before a diagnosis of mitochondrial disease has been made, which is why I've focused on MMR. I always advise giving vaccinations because any distress the child has from the vaccination is always much milder than that that they would get from contracting wild type disease. And there are ways of managing the fever and things and the discomfort associated with vaccination in terms of prophylactic and uh, paracetamol, continuing to give paracetamol regularly for 48 hours after vaccination. Those are the sorts of things, again, that you can get advice on uh, from your specialist or indeed your general paediatrician. Operations, um, the most important person you want to know about for an operation is not the surgeon, not the mitochondrial specialist, it's the anaesthetist. They need to be aware that fasting for a long period is not great for your child. Um, there may be some additional pre-op investigations like an ECG that might be important. They are really important because they're the people that manage the fluids and the anaesthetics. There are particular anaesthetics we wouldn't particularly want given very fast or for very long, uh, uh, an anaesthetic called propofol. Um, and they're also the person that will arrange PICU or, or, or HDU admission. Okay, so the anaesthetist is key, um, and you need to have a chat with them before your child goes to, to theatre. There are some other medications that I think we ought to avoid in children with mitochondrial disease. Um, there are a vast number of these that on theoretical grounds one might avoid, but actually practically are very good drugs, and in fact haven't been demonstrated to cause any problem with mitochondria in clinical reality. Um, the 
International Mitochondrial Patient Organization have published a, 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 a list of these potentially mitochondrially harmful drugs. Um, they are actually hosting a workshop in November uh, in Amsterdam to refine that list and be very clear about the evidence uh, for not giving some drugs. At the moment, sodium valproate, zidovudin, which is an HIV treatment, and gentamicin are the ones that we would have concerns about. And gentamicin really um, only in those individuals where uh, there is a, a definite M mitochondrial DNA mutation at 1555. Okay, medication, supplements, and alternative therapies. This will only be three minutes, honestly. And it's a bit lighter, hopefully. So, for mitochondrial disease, sometimes I think we are in the wild west of the late 19th century, early 20th century, where uh, snake oil was, snake oil liniment was the cure for everything. Um, and what I like about this is, um, it is good for everything a liniment ought to be good for. <laughs> yeah, that's not overstating it, is it? It does its job. Anyone know who this is? This was, it was taken after a particularly long clinic. <laughs> 400, 500 BC. Hippocrates. Hippocrates. I think somebody did say that there, but fine. It's Hippocrates, that is. And anyone know what that is? Therefore, if that's Hippocrates, and that's his Hippocratic Oath, yes. And it's not my original copy before you get there. <laughs> so, Hippocratic Oath was summarized by the by, um, uh, physicians in the, in the 19th century into a Latin phrase, primum non nosari, first do no harm. Okay, and that's what clinicians, by and large, abide by. Okay. <laughs> There are, however, a whole lot of other <coughs> practitioners, I'll call them, out there. Um, and there are all sorts of other medications and supplements and things that are out there, and it's a very confusing landscape. Jill touched this on this briefly before when she talked about drug development. You know, you come up with an idea to get it to regulatory approval, it's about 10 years and it's about two and a half billion pounds worth of investment. Okay? Many people would like to bypass that. And there are a number that, um, of medications or supplements that Alison asked me about. She asked me about nicotinamide, uh, nicotinamide riboside, which is an NAD plus donor. And in fact, that's a, 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 a B, <coughs> B vitamin complex. And it is undergoing some clinical trials. And, and may well prove to be a very helpful compound. Um, PQQ, mitochondrial ATP fuel, a bit less so. This is mitochondrial intensive. It's 27.95 for 14 sachets on Amazon. I'm not advertising on their behalf. That's the list of contents for mitochondrial. Those in red are sugars. Uh, those in blue are oils. Uh, and the rest are either vitamins that you would find in ordinary food, probably not much more concentration than that either. But certainly CoQ10, which most people are prescribed from their mitochondrial center, riboflavin, which is also available in most mitochondrial centers, um, and a great deal of magnesium. These are listed in terms of the absolute <coughs> amount, or absolute <coughs> content. So my, most of that is magnesium, and you can see the rest of it's either sugar or starch. And they're charging two pounds a sachet for that. Acupuncture, ancient Chinese art of, um, this is from the National uh, Institute for Health, National Center for Complementary and Integrative Medicine in the US. This is their overview of acupuncture. And bottom line is that, that they suggest that with acupuncture, the research is indicative that they can help with some forms of pain, but the evidence for its use in other health aspects is uncertain. Um, it's generally considered safe, but again, you, this is practiced outside of the NHS largely, um, so you want to make sure that the, the, the practitioner is using sterile needles. Okay, that's the, that's the major concern. Um, and if the acupuncture isn't performed correctly, it can lead to serious side effects. 
That is the most worried looking infant I've ever seen. <laughs> um, cranial osteopathy. Um, the, again, this is, this is not me speaking. I was very conscious I didn't project my views particularly on, on, on some of these practices. This is from the Sutherland Cranial, Co Cranial College. Um, the osteopaths are regulated um, and perhaps on the practice within the NHS. They've been regulated since 1993. Uh, they're trained to diagnose conventionally and also use their hands to assess body function and dysfunction. Uh, they use highly developed sense of touch to feel subtle changes of tension and tissue quality. But this is the important bit. They do not primarily treat medical conditions. They're more concerned with a cascade of events which could have contributed to the development of those medical conditions. So that's not me saying that, that's the college that developed osteopathy. This guy Sutherland uh, was the uh, founder of the, the college and the, the developed this technique. They also agree that cranial osteopathy is difficult to prove as a clinical benefit. Homeopathy, um, holistic medicine, specially prepared, highly diluted substance. The more dilute the substance, the more powerful it is. I'm going to bear that in mind when I have the journey back up to Newcastle tonight and I pour myself a whiskey. <laughs> Not. I'll get there before I pour the whiskey, I think. <laughs> um, basis is that it, it, this treats like with like, uh, that a substance which causes symptoms in a large amount can be used to treat symptoms in a very dilute amount. There's no scientific basis for this. It, of course, doesn't stop people using it. And um, uh, this is from the Society of Homeopaths. Um, they, they have a, a video on it. It doesn't say very much scientifically. But what it does do is it lists a long list of celebrities who uh, are practicing homeopathy. Okay, I'm not going to talk about advanced care planning because I think we had an excellent talk on that. Despite what you said about your your ability to to speak, I think that was that was really good. Um, what I will do is just give a shout out to Cecilia Jimenez Moreno, who's just over there, um, and this is about a, a study called Prefer. Um, Cecilia is going to be around for the rest of the weekend. Um, this is a study, of, um, I, I realize I'm hijacking this talk to do this. Um, we, as doctors and researchers, often think we know what's best for patients. And, you know, we look at things very scientifically about, well, if we developed a molecule that did this, it could treat that, and that would be the end of that disease. But that's not how it works most of the time. Um, and even when it does work that way, it takes an awfully long time to get there. So what this study is about is asking patients and their families what they would prefer in terms of treatment. What are their goals and objectives? So what matters, uh, how much it matters to them, weighing up options. You know, if we could give you a perfect treatment but it took 20 years to develop it, would that be sufficient? Or would you be happy that we did something in the next two years? It's those kinds of assessments. And what are the trade-offs that people are willing to make? So um, Cecilia will be around the rest of the weekend to answer questions. I'm going to finish there because I'm getting really dirty looks in the back of the room. <laughs>